too late to back out of this. Yeah. Can we can we pull the plug? I'll donate two hundred dollars to the charity. Two, of, I'll give two thousand. <laughs> if we can get out of this right now, I'll give ten thousand. I mean. Based on the 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 effort, the work that was put into these stories, uh, they were detailed. They were they were well written. The the the, the descriptions Tw- are incredible. Twenty thousand, twenty twenty five, twenty five. Uh, I don't know if there's a number high enough. I I think we we owe it to the listeners. Uh, uh, you know, uh, they wrote them. They wrote these stories, uh, and I read them. And now you're going to hear okay. them. Okay, all right. Uh, at least five of them. Uh, you know, I, I just, okay. Uh, I, I just read. Story. I read one. I read one thing you tweeted last night, and I went to bed. I, I closed my lap. It was one of those things where I closed my laptop and I was bright red and I was alone. I turned bright red, the color of my beautiful hair. <laughs> uh, well, I so embarrassed. If, you, uh, if you were bright red from those little teasers I put up on Twitter, <laughs> uh, you're you're about to be uh, 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 pushing the, the bounds of the color spectrum in terms of how red you can get. Forbidden Desires. The warm Caribbean breeze blew through the Crypt Keeper's brittle hair as he leaned out over the railing of the cruise ship. (laughs) The vast water shone bright before him, sparkling to the horizon as he raised a bony hand to shield his eyes from the sun. Oh, what a ghoulishly good time I've had on this cruise. Even a stiff like me needs to unwind from time to time. The Crypt Keeper turned away from the sea and began to shuffle slowly below decks towards his cabin. He arrived at his door, unlocked it, and slowly opened it. As he walked in, his rotting eyes fell upon the remains from last night's debauchery. A pasty white man lay face up on the Crypt Keeper's bed. The man's wrists and ankles were handcuffed to the bed frame. He was naked, except for a red ball gag jammed into his mouth. His sizable paunch hung over his manhood, providing a small measure of modesty. <laughs> Garrison, my dear, how are you feeling today? Garrison Keeler replied. Oh, silly me. Now where are my manners? The Crypt Keeper walked over to the bed and removed the ball gag from his mouth. I, uh, I, uh, don't know where to begin. Uh, last night was beyond anything I thought possible. I, I've always been afraid to speak my deepest desires out loud, but I, I feel safe when I'm with you. The Crypt Keeper picked up the whip laying on the nightstand. Hmm, safe, you say? Well, I'm not exactly a safety-first type of ghoul. <laughs> Ooh, you're a bad boy, aren't you, Garrison? Well, the Crypt Keeper knows how to deal with bad boys. He cracked the whip across Garrison's ample breasts. Like woe be gone, like woe be gone. Ah. Using our safe word so soon, are we? Well, I'm disappointed in you, but rules are rules. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. I've invited a special friend of mine to join in the fun. I hope you're open to expanding your horizons. <laughs> Garrison's eyes widened with recognition. No, it can't be. Oh, it's me all right, Mr. Keeler, responded Grimace. The large purple beast of McDonald Land lore waddled towards the bed. I've been a fan of yours for years, going back to your Minneapolis public radio days. Garrison grew hard at the compliment, his manhood quickly rising and pushing aside his gut to make itself known. <laughs> oh my... We're going to have to do something about that. As Grimace bent towards the bed, 
The Crypt Keeper noticed a puddle forming on the cabin floor under him. Grimace, my putrid purple friend, what is that? Oh dear, Grimace always shoots the squirt when he gets excited. Hmm. Well then, get ready to squirt a lot more. <laughs> The Visit Brett stands quietly in his kitchen, eyes closed, massaging one of his famous rubs into a fresh slab of catfish. Allowing his senses to guide him, he reaches out to his spice rack, fingers grazing the jars of tarragon and bike chain lubricant, and grasps a jar simply labeled blue. Never opening his eyes, he trusts his intuition to work the mysterious ingredient into the folds. A knock at the door jolts him from his reverie. Refusing to wash his hands and risk compromising the flavor, he crosses to it, holding his hands up like he's scrubbed in for surgery. He opens the door to reveal a well-dressed man. He looks official, bearing a serious expression. But Brett notes a weariness behind his eyes that hints at a softer side. Producer Brett? The man asks, his voice as smooth as honey. It would make a fine glaze. Brett thought to himself. Please call me Brett. The corners of the man's mouth threaten to turn upwards into a smile, but he resists. I would, but I'm here on official business. He reaches into his back pocket and removes a wallet, which he holds open for Brett to examine. A golden badge, emblazoned with a sturdy-looking child clad in lederhosen. I'm a representative from the Hackers Corporation. May I come in? The mood between them shifts. Brett stiffens, regretting that he asked this man to call him by his name. Nevertheless, he holds his front door open. The hacker's rep enters, carrying a cumbersome briefcase. Brett closes the door and pauses, deferring to the hacker's rep's dominant presence. Please, sit. The hacker's rep insists, gesturing to the floor. Brett follows the instruction, resisting the temptation to steal a whiff of his sticky hands for reassurance. The hacker's rep opens his briefcase and removes a wooden footstool and a scroll. He sits on the stool in front of Brett, clearly comfortable with his commanding role. We, the Hackers Corporation, are issuing the following decree in accordance with Section 31 of the Hackers Code of Conduct. Producer Brett, having sent several distressing emails to the Hackers Corporation, will be removed from society and placed in Hackers Jail. Hackers does not take lightly the mention of infested flour, nor the threat of being tricked with cats, a threat which others have followed through with on many previous occasions. The hacker's rep rolls up his scroll, bracing for the brutal tirade that typically follows an announcement like this. But it doesn't come. Brett's innocent eyes are wide and fearful. You can't put me in the hacker's jail. Uh, My hosts need me. They're so quirky, they they won't be able to cope without me. Please, there must be something I can do. Ten years of arresting people on behalf of the Hecker's Corporation. And this is the first time anyone has ever challenged the rep like this. He can feel himself melting. That Brett would put the needs of his quirky hosts before his own. Brett notices the Hecker's rep's hesitation and realizes his opportunity. He moves from his sitting position to kneel between the rep's legs and leans into him. Brett watches as the hacker's rep's eyes follow his hands every move, however slight. There must be something I can do. The hacker's rep looks into Brett's eyes, no longer seeing innocence. He had let his guard down, and now he was a fly in a spider's web. Brett holds his hands up in prayer to the hacker's rep, and bites his lip with an intensity that only Lin-Manuel Miranda could match. What is that smell? The hacker's rep asks. Brett could have laughed. It was all too easy. I make rubs and glazes for fish. The hacker's rep's mouth falls ajar, his breathing slow and deliberate as he salivates, unable to take his eyes off Brett's hands. It's been... So long since I've tasted anything that isn't flour. Sometimes I've tried to eat my footstool. The hacker's rep continues, the lump in his throat audible as he begs for Brett to give him some release. 
Brett gently brings his right hand towards the Hecker's rep's mouth, the two of them holding eye contact. The Hecker's rep leans cautiously toward Brett's finger before Brett slides it deep into his mouth. They maintain their gaze, saying so much while saying nothing at all, as the Hecker's rep sucks the rub off Brett's finger. Brett slowly pulls it out, dragging it down the rep's bottom lip and chin. Is that bubblegum? The rep asks, savoring the taste. Brett leans in, his mouth tantalizingly close to the rep's now. I'll never tell. Instantaneously, they begin making out. It's frenzied, animalistic. They stand and clumsily make their way to Brett's kitchen, mouths not leaving each other for a second. The hacker's rep reaches for Brett's belt, but Brett pushes his hands away. These alchemist robes are custom made. No one touches them but me. Brett's forcefulness only spurs the hacker's rep on, exhilarated by finally being on the receiving end of an admonishment. They resume kissing and strip themselves, Brett gingerly putting his fine silken attire aside. They pause for a moment to take each other in, Brett admiring the unbleached forever tattoo styled in cursive across the hacker's rep's chest. Brett grabs a handful of his fish rub and proceeds to work it over the Hecker's rep's throbbing dick. The Hecker's rep grabs his own handful, ignoring Brett's frown as an unworthy hand touches his rub. They jack each other off, the smell of salt, sweat, and bubble gum filling the air between them. Oh, producer Brett, moans the Hecker's rep. Call me baby Goldilocks. Brett replies breathlessly. Oh, baby Goldilocks. Alec Baldwin hosts an orgy. Alec Baldwin stood at the front of his screening room and addressed his assembled guests. Before we enjoy this week's screening of Broadway Danny Rose, I thought I should explain a few things. First, I've removed all the seats and replaced them with rubber sheets, pillows, and cushions. This is to facilitate the evening's, uh, shall we say, erotic endeavors. Next, now that everyone has finished their chili, generously supplied by our friends from Terlingua, I should tell you... Alec paused as a devilish grin spread across his face. I had the Crypt Keeper add an extra special ingredient. (laughs) I dosed it with Spanish fly. I call it 69 Alarm Texas Suck and Fuck Surprise. (laughs) Just then, an old 35mm projector kicked to life in the back of the room. The reels whirred as the film began to play. Everyone was delighted to see that instead of the usual critically acclaimed Woody Allen film, the title Horny Danny Bones, a porn parody, appeared on screen. No longer able to contain their excitement. And spurred on by the action on screen, everyone in the room began vigorously sucking and fucking each other. Alec Baldwin pulled down Woody Allen's corduroy pants to reveal a bedazzled G-string. This time I'll be spilling more than just chili on my pants, Jack Nicholson said as he pulled down his chili-stained sweatpants to reveal his rock-hard erection. Seeing this, Mr. Buxton got on all fours and joyously exclaimed, Cock, please! Martin Scorsese presented his naked body to a black leather-clad Fran Leibowitz. I'm gonna make you scream just like that IHOP paper towel dispenser! (laughs) Marty's uproarious laughing could hardly be heard through the ball gag in his mouth. Uh. (sighs) My god, I hate the decor in here, said Scott Adams. Good thing I brought this. Adams brought out a giant dildo in the shape of Dilbert's head and inserted it into himself. Long into the night, everybody fucked and sucked and made each other come. Alec Baldwin's screening room was messier than the bottom of a stockpot at the end of a three-day chili cook-off. By the time the credits on Horny Danny Bones were rolling, everyone lay in a giant wet mess, thoroughly exhausted. Everyone, that is, except Brayat 
who sat at his laptop, furiously transcribing everything that happened. Oh, wait until Jerry from Tea Public hears about this. Hello, baby. Yeah, this is the Big Bopper speaking. <laughs> oh, you sweet man. Keep them satisfied. You want to keep the talent happy? Find me my filet of fish Tom's words rung inside Brett's head, taunting him. Fish, fish. It's my goddamn podcasting network. Who does he think he is? But deep down, Brett knew it was true. No Tom and Julie, no podcast. No podcast, no podcast network. No podcast network, and Brett was out of luck. And out of all the expensive rubs and marinades he needed for his own homemade fish fillets. Brett had been to five different McDonald's in the greater Los Angeles County, and every single one was sold out of filet of fish sandwiches. Brett was desperate. He needed those sandwiches, or Tom would walk. There was only one solution left. He just never thought he'd go back to that life. He pulled up to the seedy little motel on La Cienega. Well, time to work some magic, he told himself. The captain was already waiting for him in the room, red coat open, the frilly shirt half undone, vest open, <coughs> that stupid parrot sitting on his shoulder as he sat propped up in bed. So, you need me sandwiches? I do. You must need them pretty badly to be meeting with us like this. I, I do. I need those sandwiches, and you're the only one who knows how to get any right now. Hmm. How much do you want them? Brett sat down next to Captain Crook and put his hand high on the pantalooned thigh. Mm. Captain, I'm desperate. His hand drifted toward the captain's growing bulge. Captain looked down at Brett. Are you sure you just want a fillet of fish? Because it looks to me, matey, like you're hungry for more. Back at the studio, Tom was ravenous. You were gone for hours. Did, did you go all the way to McDonald land? Do you have to catch and cook the fish yourself? Brett shook his head. It wasn't that hard. Well, I mean, it wasn't that difficult. In fact, I'll make another run anytime you want. One night in Brett. Taking out a few black dusters from his closet, Brett began to pack his suitcase for his upcoming road trip with Tom and Julie. This would be his first year as a judge at the Terlingua Championship Cook-Off. Brett had been dreaming about attending this event for a while, but it wasn't just for the culinary exploration. Brett was more interested in the potential of meeting Mr. Concoction. Brett had briefly heard about this mysterious Mr. Concoction, a.k.a. Rob, during a prerequisite chili chat with the Chili Appreciation Society International. As an alchemist himself, he wanted to get inside Rob's brain and absorb any knowledge he could from this dazzling wizard. He tried to stop his racing thoughts, but he couldn't deny the deep, sensual ping echoing inside him. Brett imagined Rob sucking glazes and rubs off his fingers. He shook his head in embarrassment and tearfully whispered, Mr. Concoction will never love a stupid podcast producer like me. Brett left to pick up Tom and Julie. Hours later, as the miles passed closer to the destination, Brett could feel his heart fluttering excitedly. Tom noticed and said, Wow, you sure look enthused, Brett. You know, this is just a stupid chili party for stupid chili bros, right? Brett and Julie shot Tom an annoyed glare and quickly reminded him of how the onion made him look like a fool so he can keep his chilly opinion to himself. Tom remained silent for the rest of the ride, giving Brett some much-needed time to fantasize about Rob's muscular pecs. 
As they arrived at the competition, Brett looked around, only to realize that Tom and Julie had already ditched him. Feeling helpless and frightened, he began to wander around the cook-off ranch. He tried to focus on what he knew best. He put his energy from his restless libido into chili judging. After six bowls of chili, the passion was rising. He made an exit to the bathroom to relieve his growing erection. He removed his belt and started to pleasure himself. Unfortunately, there was still chili powder on his hands, and his member promptly started burning. He rushed to the sink and tried to wash off the chili powder, but the water was just spreading the capsaicin around. He heard the door open, and he shamefully tried to cover himself. Not knowing how to explain what was going on, he stood in silence. The man who entered the bathroom almost left just as immediately, but a few moments later he returned with a gallon of milk in his noticeably strong arms. This should help, he said before pouring the entire gallon of milk all over Brett's throbbing cock. Uh, thanks. Sorry, I'm new here. The man's eyes went wide as if he was in shock. Wait. He exclaimed loudly. Are you Brett? The... The alchemist of rubs and glazes? I recognize you from your voice. I love Forever Dog. Brett reached for some napkins to soak up the milk off his dong. He looked back up at the stranger and realized how handsome and magnetizing his energy was. Brett adjusted his milky dong and responded. Yippers, I'm Brett, the Forever Dog money man. And he held out his hand for a shake. The handshake continued for what seemed like a long time, neither of them wanting to let go of the other one. Finally, the man broke the silence by saying, Well, Brett, you can call me Rob. Brett was aghast. Was this a dream? He couldn't believe he was meeting his crush for the first time, and he didn't even have his pants on. Now it was Brett's turn to be wide-eyed and shocked, he was so close to the sacred knowledge within the confines of Rob's body. I heard you make a chili with 29 ingredients. That's buck wild. Putting the gallon of milk on the bathroom counter, Rob leaned in close to Brett. He was pressed up against him, pinning Brett to the counter. Rob murmured in Brett's ear. I bet we could make a chili with 69 ingredients. <laughs> <laughs>